I'm gonna try to get this right. No promises though, right? I'm an evolutionary biologist. Um, you've just heard a, a couple of talks from people that you might call real scientists. Um, what I do, people who think in numbers would refer to as just pretend science, um, but I like to think that I'm, I'm trying my best to, to move evolutionary biology forward, to, to come up with some real hard empirical evidence about how populations and species evolve. And we can use that information to make decisions about how to manage problems such as extinction of different species or the destruction of habitat. So today I'm going to talk just about a small portion of the research that I do and my group does and focus really on understanding extinctions. When you think about extinctions, you probably first think about this particular extinction. This is the extinction that happened at the end of the Cretaceous, the KT boundary and it resulted in the destruction of pretty much all the dinosaurs, right? Does anybody know why this particular extinction happened? I mean, this is the most famous one, right? Everybody knows about this stuff, right? What was it? Meteors. It's a big asteroid, right? Massive asteroid that's been discovered. We're pretty sure about this now. I mean, we, we don't know a lot about why these different enormous environmental changes happen, but we do know something about this because we found the massive crater in the surface of the Earth. We say, hey, this dates to the same time as all the dinosaurs went extinct. Kind of good news for us because when they went extinct, our little ancestors, those tiny little hairy warm-blooded things took off and it's thanks to this that we're around. But how many of you knew that this was actually the fifth mass extinction event to happen in Earth? We lost about 70% of species during this particular mass extinction event, and it was the fifth extinction to happen. The third extinction is my favorite because it's, caused, it's called the Great Dying. Now, that's a pretty awesome name for an extinction event, right? And this extinction event was about 250 million years ago, the third one, as I said. We lost about 96% of species that lived on the planet at that time. 96%. That's a pretty big dying, probably why I got that nickname. Um, but this, again, was caused by massive environmental changes, habitat changes, changes to the environment. This time it was volcanic eruptions that happened along the sea floor, changed the temperature of the water, and caused an enormous impact to the mostly marine community that lived on the planet at this time. And now, starting about 10,000 years ago, we're going through what many people are calling the sixth mass extinction event in our planet's history. This began about 10,000 years ago. It's often called the, called the megafaunal mass extinction. It was at the end of the Pleistocene, the beginning of the Holocene, which is when we live right now. And who knows what's causing this particular mass extinction event? Anybody? Oh, back there, back there. You? Us. You? <laughs> yes, we think. Is it us? Well, is it us? I mean, and, and can we really say that it's us? And um, I think if we look at the evidence um, that we seem to be accumulating, we can say that we are having quite a tremendous impact on our environment. And we need to understand the impact that we're having, because if we can understand how we are changing our environment, maybe then we can start to make some better predictions or some better estimates, so, some better plans about how we're going to figure out what to do about this major problem. And so really what we want to know, I'm skipping ahead of myself here, this, this is just some evidence that we're really in charge of the extinction event. This is the dodo. It's probably the most famous of all the human-driven extinction, anim extinct animals. Dodo went extinct only a couple hundred years ago. Um, it only lived on an island, the island of Mauritius. It's about 500 kilometers off the coast of Madagascar. Humans first arrived on the island, and dodos were extinct within 50 years. It's pretty quick. And it happened not because people were eating them, because apparently they tasted pretty bad. There's a lot of stuff written about them from the, the Portuguese and the Dutch sailors at the time. But because humans brought with them all these commensal organisms, pigs and dogs and rats, and dodos nested on the ground. They had a single egg in a big nest on the ground, and the pigs loved that. And they were like, oh, I'll have that, yeah. And if you can't reproduce, you're not gonna survive. And so being a not very scared predator, um, little tiny bird thing, big, fat, nasty thing that lives at an island was not a good strategy for surviving humans if you're a dodo. 
This is another example of an island animal that went extinct very recently. This has been extinct for about 3,000 years, member of the crocodile family from Fiji. This thing would apparently hang in the trees, and as you walked by, it would jump down and try to eat your head. <coughs> It's a good reason to make it go extinct, but you know. So here we're starting to see a pattern. Is it that things are living on islands and that's why they go extinct? Well, maybe. And then we can take into consideration the next thing, the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon did not live on an island and it did not live in very small numbers. In fact, it lived in enormous numbers and people would say that you could, it would black out the sun in the sky for minutes at a time as these flocks of pigeons went overhead and they went extinct within 50 years, and nobody knows why. So clearly there's more going on than just being an island endemic species or just living in a small specific habitat. Something is causing these particular species to go extinct while other species survive. And what I'd like to be able to do is try to understand why some species disappear and others survive and harness that information to make appropriate and financially sound decisions about what species we should protect. So the questions are, what is our role in these mass extinctions that are going on right now? Who, as in which species, are most at risk from us, from habitat change, from climate change, from the destruction of resources? And then finally, if we can identify who's at risk, what can we do to actually stop this extinction from happening? If you think about modern species, and here we talk about the polar bear for a minute. This is a picture that my colleague Tom Andrews Taught, um, took up in the Arctic when he was sampling polar bears last year. Um, we're interested to preserve the polar bear. We like him. He's big, he's white, he's cool. He's pretty much an icon for the dangers of global warming. And we think we'd like to, to stop him from going extinct. We're probably not going to be able to do that. But the way that we're studying this is we look at the modern populations, we take some samples from each of these modern populations, we learn about their genetic diversity, and we try to correlate things like which populations are doing well and which populations are doing not so well with differences in, in the environment or differences in the habitat in which they live. But there's a problem with this. And that problem is that when we start with a small population, we only start with the knowledge we have right now. And if we have a small population, like we have here, everybody is pretty much genetically identical. Here, you can see <laughs> genetic identity by colors of clothing, right? What we know happened to these populations was that at some point in the past, they were actually quite diverse. And now we have genetic diversity, again, represented by colors of clothing. What we want to know when we're trying to figure out when and how these populations are affected by climate change is when all of this genetic diversity disappeared. And what happens, and uh, in this incredibly well-drawn illustration, is that you go through what's called a genetic bottleneck or a population bottleneck, where you start with lots of diversity and you end up with your population, which is big here, getting smaller. And as it gets smaller, only a little bit of that genetic diversity survives to the present. And what we want to be able to do is to sample this diversity and this diversity and figure out when this bottleneck happens. And if we can figure out when that bottleneck happens and how tight that bottleneck was, we can learn something about how the environment is influencing the diversity of these populations. So we want to know when. Click. <laughs> this is click again. <laughs> Thank you. And so to do this, I go with my friends to ridiculous places. And here you can see me last summer, and I've gone to a place called Katanga, um, the Timer Peninsula, the middle of the Timer Peninsula, where there's absolutely nothing. Uh, you have to take a Russian helicopter for a very long way away to get there, and it's very scary, especially if it's run by French people who sit on top of the giant canisters of petrol smoking cigarettes while you're in the air. <laughs> Um, that makes it very scary. Um, and I tried to get bones and other things from, click, from animals that lived in the past. And this is just a, a quick uh, iteration. This is my lab, actually. And this is somebody who's working in my lab. And they're about to do some sterile work on these ancient specimens. We wear these suits, not because we're scared of the stuff that's there, but because we don't want our own DNA to contaminate the samples that we've collected. We grind it up, so we get bones or skin or hair or whatever, and we grind it up into some fine powder. This is bone powder here. Click. <laughs> 
bit of a slow, slow moving thing here. Um, and actually, oh God, I have to do this again. Um, I normally take all the pictures that I'm using. Um, I had to put this talk together for something that I did at National Geographic a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't have any pictures of bone powder. And normally I get my pictures off of Wikipedia or Google when I can't find pictures. And I couldn't find any pictures of bone powder. That's cocaine. Um, <laughs> But it looks a lot like bone powder. And uh, so, yeah. Um, and then uh, we make a nice little cocktail out of it with some enzymes and stuff. And, uh, and we amplify it up by a process called the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We get these gels and we run them out and we get these really beautiful pictures of peaks. It doesn't work that way. Actually, it's a lot harder than that. And my students would be really mad if they saw me simplify it like this. But that's how it is. And we work mostly in this place called Beringia. And the reason we work here, and here you'll see it changing. Here's the date up here. Yeah. And this is Alaska. And this is Siberia. And this is the coastline as it's changing through the years. And during the ice ages, the sea level was a lot lower because all the water was taken up into glaciers. And this whole land right here was a massive grassland that supported things like mammoths and mastodons and lions and giant beavers and all sorts of crazy things that you wouldn't have thought existed. And we can get DNA from all this stuff going back a couple hundred thousand years. This is important because if we want to test how these animals are responding to climate change, we have a couple of really good examples or good testable hypotheses here. And that's the peak of the last ice age that happened 20,000 years ago. The first introduction of humans into North America, human hunting, could be a hypothesis for why these things are going extinct. That was 14,000 years ago. And the extinction happened about 10,000 years ago. So we can go back well before all of this and explicitly test, visualize in real time, how each of these things change the genetic diversity of the populations of animals whose bones we collect. And so we go out there. And this is what it looks like. This is exactly what it looks like. This is not photoshopped in any way. And um, you see that there are all sorts of large mammals that are there during the Pleistocene. And you've got bison and wolves and giant bears. And there was this, this guy here. This is Arctodus. He's a short-faced bear. Um, he, uh, he went extinct because he was scary. And you would have killed him too. And, um, and there's a giant beaver, five feet tall. <laughs> Seriously, that did exist. I didn't make that up. Yeah. And um, all we're left with now is brown bears, caribou, and in some places, some sheep and some muskox. So we used to have a much more diverse landscape than we have now. So we can test all of these different things, get independent estimates of what's going on, and see how these different scenarios are influencing stuff. So we fly out into the permafrost. We take helicopters. We take boats into the middle of nowhere. We go looking for bones. Click in these different environments where we go along these lake beds or we go along rivers. And these are some of my colleagues that are searching for bones here. If we have no luck, which happens quite a lot, we go and chat to some of the local people. And this is a Dolgan woman who is some of the last nomadic people. They live in Siberia. And they often have a good idea of where some of these bones are coming out of the permafrost. So they're an incredible resource for us up there. We set up our campsites. Click. And um, that's a bit out of focus. Oh, no, it's not. That's just mosquitoes. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun to work up in Siberia and in the Arctic because there's lots of mosquitoes. But we do collect really good amounts of bones. And here you see these are some fragments of mammoths. This right here is a mammoth kneecap. Um, these are some other bones that are from mammoth. These are some horse and bison bones over here. These are some vertebra from bison. So we get good, this is from about a half a day's collecting. So we do get a good quantity of bones that we can extract DNA from. We grind them up into a little bit of powder. And we take them back to the lab where we do our magic work on them. And this is just a summary slide, because obviously I don't have time to go into all the things we're finding. These are some of the animals that we've been working with so far. Brown bears, lions, mammoths, muskox, bison, and horses. We see that some of these guys are still surviving, and some of them are extinct. And we can sample their DNA from up to about 200,000 years. And I've helpfully color-coded these year periods by the temperature. The snowflake indicates an ice age. Yes. <laughs> yes. And just to show you a couple of quick results, we have bison and mammoths here. 
And this is a plot that shows the population size and how it changes through time. So we started about 50,000 years ago and we go to today. And the pink here is the bison, so it starts off with a big population, it gets smaller, plateaus, gets smaller again, and then it increases to its present population size. Horses are pretty flat, but they go through a bit of an increase and then a decrease. The important things to take away from this picture are that bison and horses are not responding to the climate in the same way, that they're actually responding to a climate in a way that you would expect they would because they have different requirements for living places. So bison, for example, they're ruminants, they need to feed their bacteria, they need a very rich grassland. And so here we see the grassland starting to disappear as we get close to this. This is the last glacial maximum, the peak of the last ice age. Bison start to decline well before that, and as they start to decline, the horses actually increase. They're going, there's no more bison competing for space. I'm going to come in here. But then the climate gets even colder and all this stuff the horses eat goes away and we end up with horses starting to decline as well. Key point to take away from here is that here's the peak of the last ice age. Here's people first coming into North America. Here is the beginning of this decline, the beginning of the extinction event. Just look quickly at one more species. This is a musk ox. Again, we see the peak of the last ice age and here we've sampled musk ox from five different populations. So we have some different ideas of when people arrived in these landscapes. And here we have people arriving in Siberia, that's the red population here. In Canada, that's the blue population, uh, the light blue population, and in Greenland, the dark blue population. The key point to take away from this is, again, the peak of the last ice age is not causing, the climate change there is not causing these things to go extinct, and neither is the appearance of people in any of these places. In fact, it looks like as people first move into Greenland from Canada, the muskox population takes off, and the people in Greenland are still using muskox as subsistence farmers. And I am going to speed through this here because I've used up my time, but here we have a summary of all these different taxa. And here's the peak of the last ice age, and here's the first arrival of humans. And you see that while all of these things are changing, they're being influenced by changes in our environment. They're not, the beginning of this influence is not because people have come in there, but what we need to do is we need to look at this ultimate, ultimate extinction event here. And what we see is that there is a very tight link between the end of this extinction event and the first appearance of people. So what I hypothesize is going on is that throughout the Pleistocene, we had lots of cold, then warm, then cold, then warm periods. And as the climate changed, as it got colder, species and populations got into trouble. They started not being able to survive. They lost the ability to find enough resources to do what they needed to do. But then it got warm again and they recovered. And then it got cold again and they got in trouble. And then it got warm again and they recovered. And then it got cold again and they got in trouble. And then it got warm again and then people came in and killed them. <laughs> so it is our fault. So what we need to know here is that we are changing the habitat. We are changing our environment. Everything is changing because of us. If we weren't here, maybe stuff would have just recovered the way it was before, but it's different. We know that species are responding to, diff to, to, the same, to the same climate changes in different ways, and we can start to get an idea of what's going on. But it's our responsibility to do something about this, because it's our fault. And hopefully, we can start to learn enough about what's going on that we can start to make some informed decisions about how to spend our money and our time and our energy to really make a difference to what's going on with climate change. Terrific. Thanks very much.